look at that fat fuck. <laughs> No harm in fat shaming. I do not care because that motherfucker is me. Yes. Can't, I don't even think that was me at my heaviest. But uh, yeah, I wanted to. This is like truly embarrassing to share with anybody, quite frankly. But I want to let you know I'm the real deal uh, when it comes to how fucking uh, chunky. What a chunky monkey I was. Uh, which isn't a bad thing, uh, if you're healthy, but I definitely was not healthy. So, I wanted to, um, share my thoughts on fasting with you guys. Uh, I started down this rabbit hole around, like, December of 2017, um, with prolonged fasting. Um, the prior, the previous year I had been on, uh, intermittent fasting. So I wrote notes down. I shared them with friends and family. It seemed to help a bunch of people. Fasting is, uh, definitely more talked about. I think I heard Kevin Smith on his latest podcast, uh, saying he did 90 some odd hours of, uh, fasting. So I wanted to share with you what I know, but let's get the disclaimers out of the way. You got to do it. I am not a healthcare professional by no means. Um, do your own research, consult physicians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, before making any, you know, sort of drastic changes to your diet. Uh, you are responsible for your own health. Okay, so here are my notes. Uh, and what I thought was peculiar and interesting was after the second day of my first prolonged fast. So I was doing 16-8, uh, which means you eat for 16 hours of the day and you uh, you eat during an eight hour window and you fast for 16 hours of the day. And that helped me out a lot. Uh, let me give you a recap of how I got that um, large uh, to begin with. Uh, I actually had struggled with weight uh, a whole bunch. Uh, up and down, I was a calories in, calorie out person. So I would gain 50 pounds and then using uh, calorie restriction, I would get back down but it was yo-yo, constantly up and down, up and down, up and down. And then I went vegetarian. I was vegetarian for five years. What was my diet? You say that led me to, as a vegetarian, get up to 300 pounds. Well, it was carb-based, right? It was just a bunch of carbs, 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 sugars. Uh, not saying I was the healthiest vegetarian as like, uh, I had a lot of cake. That was my favorite vegetarian food, cake. Uh, so no wonder I got, you know, sort of that big to begin with. Getting off of uh, uh, the vegetarian diet and reintroducing meat helped satiate me. Uh, I was no longer perennially hungry throughout the day. Um, uh, so that was a big help. I lost a little bit of weight there. Switched to keto then. Uh, so limiting my carbs, that helped as well. Started intermittent fasting and then that just kind of supercharged um, everything. And then I kind of plateaued. And that's when I sort of dug into the whole concept of fasting. I was kind of aware of fasting um, to begin with. But let me get to the point where what got me to start writing these notes down is the interesting thing was on the second day of my fast, I wasn't hungry anymore. I mean, I thought by fasting, the hunger would have like this sort of cumulative effect and my appetite would grow as the days went on. But by day four, I was even like less hungry. I felt clear headed and better than when I, you know, was doing the calorie restriction down to 1500 calories a day. So this confused me and I needed to find out why and if what I was doing was okay. So I went down the internet rabbit hole. I discovered Dr. Jason Fung. Uh, if you don't know him, why don't I, uh, let's see, why don't I share that with you guys? That's Dr. Jason Fung back there. And let's, uh, you didn't see that. <laughs> uh, green screen back. All right, so that's Dr. Jason Fung. Uh, he's a brilliant dude. Um, I th so what was he? He's uh, a nephrologist. Uh, so that's like kidney and hypertension, uh, specializing in diabetes treatment. Um, so I found talks um, uh, as well from um, Dr. Uh, Rhonda Patrick, which you can see here, catch a lot of her on the uh, Joe Rogan experience. And uh, also Dr. Dr. Walter, Walter Longo, uh, he's famous for the fasting uh, mimicking diet. Um, but 
Uh, these are, you know, uh, well-known uh, people, so you can go down the same rabbit holes I did. They're, you know, all on YouTube. Uh, Dr. Walter Longo, he's in a bunch of documentaries. I actually had the privilege to film him for the Palo Alto Longevity Prize, um, uh, where he talked about fasting as, you know, a way to prolong uh, not just good health, but uh, also longevity. Um, also, Dr. Mosley, um, Dr. June Yoon, who I used to work for, and Dr. Hunt. Uh, he was the oncologist I interviewed in Philly. So, um, you know, I had a little bit of background and understanding of fasting and, and how it's healthy. And we'll get into like autophagy, apoptosis, things like that. Um, but the sources and clinical studies for the information I'm going to talk about is like publicly available and on the web. So um, what I'm going to discuss, I'm not going to reference. I'm going to put some YouTube links uh, in the description below. So look for that. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, I guess, you know, why don't we talk about uh, what started piquing my interest with Dr. Fung because his work with diabetes and, uh, you know, I, I knew people who had uh, type 2 diabetes and it sucked. Um, you know, I think in the beginning it was basically like a death sentence, right? So I think fasting has some uh, real benefits and um, Dr. Fung in particular had some interesting thoughts on why current standards of treatment for diabetes is flat wrong. You know, I will put the link to that in the um, description below, but the gist is current type 2 treatment relates to insulin level, insulin level when the issue is uh, resistance. Uh, so treating type 2 with more insulin simply makes the body need more insulin over time, leading to eventual, predictably devastating results. So my belief and my understanding started to change, and I started to believe that the real issues of our health, um, the I believe the underlying issues across many diseases is metabolic syndrome, uh, inflammation, and insulin resistance, those three things. So for me, symptoms are obvious, you know, uh, I've been overweight, so the symptom was obvious in the extra weight around, you know, the midsection, um, you know, the visceral fat. Uh, for others, symptoms might show up as like an A1C or blood glucose test. High IGF-1 uh, is also an uh, indicator of bad health. Uh, with increased risk for things like breast cancer. So we've known for many years that inflammation is a marker for chronic diseases and an indicator for longevity as well. So um, a break from food may help uh, in that regard. So, you know, some history too, because fasting has a sort of like a preconceived notion, uh, you know, I still, when, when I told people that I was doing fasting, I was uh, doing these prolonged fasts. I started with a five day fast. People were scared of that. I went to a seven day fast. Um, friends and family were uh, hesitant about that. I did a two weeker a couple times, and then I did a 30 day water fast. Um, and you know, just the response I got was always um, cautious and skeptical. Um, so there are some taboos when it comes to fasting, um, but it is becoming more accepting. Uh, this was definitely brought up several times by scientists competing in the Palo to Longevity Prize. You should um, uh, uh, check them out. They're associated with the NIH now. I believe they took over. It was started by uh, and funded by Dr. Jun Yoon. Um, though there's a history extending back thousands of years. So it makes sense from a human biological standpoint. Food resources were scarce. And cavemen didn't have access to a grocery store. You might have heard, you know, this thought process. So they would, they could and did go weeks without food. Um, Gandhi famously performed extended fasts. Spartans only ate one meal a day. You might have heard of the Spartan diet or OMAD, one meal a day. Greeks, um, like uh, Hippocrates, fasted for mental clarity. And animals instinctively do it when they're ill to heal. So... Um, you know, there was even a record, uh, I believe it was like 382 straight days from an obese 400 pound Scotsman. Um, he was monitored by physicians and took supplements during this time because it was, you know, his weight was exceptional and the duration of his fast was exceptional. So don't try anything like this on your own, obviously. Um, 
Okay, so I don't think anyone is making the argument to reset our physiology back to caveman days, but rather trying to better understand how our body was designed through a hundred thousand plus years of human evolution and the millions of years of cellular evolution. So it was only in the last, what, like 50 or so years that our nutrition has changed and began to become more processed and available. It certainly helped us to devote brain resources to other fronts and perhaps got us to a point where we may now better understand what we got right and what we got wrong as far as food. And I think of the movie Idiocracy, right? And imagine how Darwin would view the higher rate of procreation among poorer, less developed populations. So my takeaway is that more and more healthcare professionals are better understanding how our bodies were originally designed and see fasting, not the extreme ones, as an effective alternative prescription for many diseases and really a possible tool for longevity. So how we store and use energy, I think is an important topic. So food is broken down for energy and stored in two ways, either glycogen uh, or fat. Glycogen is readily available. It's held in the, in the liver and used most often, but has a limited supply. Okay, let me repeat that. So glycogen is readily available, held in the liver and used most often, but a limited supply. So stored fat is in much greater supply, right? You know, you can feel it. I can still feel even though I've lost a little bit of weight. By the way, FYI, um, that picture, I was probably hovering around 300 pounds down to like 178-ish uh, right now. Uh, and uh, the last 30 some odd pounds is uh, strictly due, due to like a 5-2 fast. Uh, and I'll talk more about the different types of fasts later on. So um, stored fat, uh, to recap, is in much greater supply, but it's accessed only when glycogen levels are depleted. So most readily available when you eat, all that stuff gets stored as glycogen in the liver and it gets used and it's used more often, your body waits for it. Um, and your fat gets used as fuel uh, only when it's, uh, your glycogen levels are depleted and that takes about 12 to 24 hours, assuming you're not intaking more of it. Uh, during that time. So any form of consistent um, carbohydrate sugar intake essentially deprives your body the chance to burn stored fat for energy. You will not access stored fat until your glycogen levels are depleted. So it's not a bad thing for normal people, but for someone like me who struggled and had a bunch of stored fat or someone who is insulin resistant, um, perhaps not so good. So the way we have been taught to eat over the last 50 years is wrong. We never give our bodies a chance to use that fat uh, for energy, yet our body has been designed really to do so. So, all right, now we know kind of a little background in history. Um, here's why I think I felt better fasting than with any other quote unquote diet. Um, First, studies show fasting doesn't affect your basal metabolic rate like it would in calorie restriction. So, for instance, eating 20% less each day, which is what I did, and then, which is how I lost weight before, is not equivalent to eating for four days and fasting for one. Okay, so even though both equate to the same amount of weekly calories in a daily calorie restricted state, um, baseline metabolism will decline. So in essence, if I go from 2,500 calories to 1,500 calories a day to lose weight and then go back to 2,000, I'd eventually gain the weight back since my body will now think I have a daily excess of 500 calories due to the metabolic change. So what's interesting is the Scotsman who fasted for 300 plus days, 380 plus days, didn't gain the 200 pounds he lost back. So hunger was not a big factor since ghrelin appetite hormone is suppressed once the body turns to fat for energy. Uh, if you were curious about that, if you're a cave person and your food supply runs out, the last thing it would do is shut down your one advantage over the beasts, your intelligence, your brain. So your basal metabolic rate remains the same in a fasting 
um, environment. Uh, in fact, adrenal response may increase because you would sort of like need to go out and hunt for food. Um, now, the other thing to consider is type 2 diabetes is a fairly recent phenomenon, coinciding, I believe, with um, the, the advent of processed carbohydrates and snacking. Um, fasting has shown the ability... Um, how can I put this? So, okay, fasting has shown the ability to, to decrease insulin resistance. Um, like, in extreme cases, um, people may need bariatric surgery, you know, the stomach stapling, and it's 95% uh, usually successful in returning diabetes markers to normal range. Fasting provides the same level of results. There's um, a sort of secondary effect that can uh, decrease high blood pressure as fasting lowers uh, triglycerides and LDL cholesterol by up to 30%. Uh, I actually was on high blood pressure medicine. I was so, you know, large. Um, and uh, uh, through fasting, um, I was able to get off the meds. So thank goodness for that. And I believe many age-related diseases can be linked to increased inflammation and fasting uh, improves C-reactive protein markers. Studies have shown fasting to protect against the accumulation of proteins in the brain responsible for Alzheimer's. Um, uh, and it may have other cognitive uh, effects. I mean, a byproduct is during that first initial week fasting is I read Dr. Fung's 300 page book in like a few hours. That's totally unusual for me. I mean, I take like an hour to read one article. I barely read. So, I mean, subtitles, no, English. Uh, but uh, autophagy, sorry, this earpiece keeps on like dragging. And stuff. So, okay, autophagy. Let's talk about autophagy. You might want to know about that. Autophagy is uh, essentially cellular self-eating. Uh, it's also kind of the new buzzword. Um, Yoshinori uh, uh, Osumi won the 2016 Nobel uh, Prize in uh, Physiology and Medicine for his work on uh, autophagy. So, Essentially, here's what it is. After glycogen levels are depleted and gluconeogenesis is completed 12 to 24 hours, typically, autophagy and increased apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, occurs. So your body is um, also preferential and in a fasted state will start to break down old degenerated cells, um, damage organelles, and has a tendency to eat marked cells, you know, like the precancerous type. So the second you introduce protein or carbohydrates, mTOR activates and autophagy stops. So all the good stuff that was happening, all this cleaning stops. So theoretically you can take on fat calories and still incur autophagy. Um, but you know, that's you know, now I'm going off on a tangent, but prolonged Fasting also promotes uh, telomere growth, which is a biomarker for longevity. That's why it's brought up a lot uh, in regards to aging. Uh, and it makes sense now that animals don't want to eat when they're sick, right? They want to regenerate. So, um, you know, high density areas of centenarians come from places like Okinawa, Latin America, um, prisoners of war. They had drastically different diets, those groups, but for one reason or another, like religion had fasting in common. I'm inclined to see fasting as a stressor similar to exercise, uh, you know, sort of breaking and rebuilding stronger. So um, let's talk about the different types of fasting, uh, fasting options you have. Um, you don't have to abstain from eating for five days or do the 30 day water fast like I did. Um, you can eat once every 24 hours. Once again, the Spartan diet or OMAD, one meal a day, which is sort of what I do in combination with the 5-2. 16-8 is, is a good introductory type intermittent fast or time-restricted eating where you only eat during an eight-hour window. 20-4 and four is a step up. You can guess. You fast for 20 hours, you eat for four, four-hour window. Uh, there's the one one. It's an alternate alternate day. So one day with food and then another day uh, followed by another day of under 500 
um, calories, hopefully nutritious. And then there's the five two where the two fasting days of your choice it could be consecutive, it could be you know separated. Um, but those days you eat under 500 calories sort of tricks your brain into thinking that you're in a fast state. Um, that's also kind of part of what Dr. Walter Longo does with his fasting mimicking diet, but I think he goes into the actual specific types of food um, um, to enhance its effects. Um, but all have shown the same impact on insulin resistance, cholesterol, high blood pressure, and inflammation. So. However, there, there are no concrete answers as to like autophagy results with the different types of fasts, with the shorter intermittent type fasts. There might be some sort of like cumulative effect and you maybe could once again, theoretically incorporate times of only fat calories to activate autophagy. Um, autophagy, I just bit my inner um, mouth. Um, does that count as breaking the fast? Cause I think I just drew blood. I'm just kidding. But let's see, by being in a, um, like theoretically, so what I'm thinking is by th being in a constant state of ketosis through like high fat, low carb, you can hypothetically lessen the time to ghrelin suppression, um, which is another um, thing to point out if you're worried about feeling hungry all the time. Um, and it could also uh, like sort of like decrease the time to get to autophagy if your body is used to the keto, uh, you know, being in ketosis. Um, so that might be a way around not having to do prolonged fasts. But, um, you know, you could do a combination combining a ketogenic type diet and intermittent fasting. Um, they kind of uh, seem to supplement each other and have increasingly beneficial effects. So um, that being said, fasting, just don't think of it as a diet. It's not a diet. You just occasionally, by whatever method you choose, don't eat whatever diet you are on. Um, I know that it seems typical that one of the pushbacks is, oh, you're gonna lose a lot of protein. Um, muscle loss because of fasting to me is a myth. Although there is some protein loss through gluconeogenesis, why would the body store energy as fat if it's uh, intended to use muscle as fuel? Right? So studies have shown that in a daily calorie restricted diet versus intermittent fasting, lean body mass actually increased, increased in those that fasted and did a better job of like skin tightening, which I would want. <laughs> but anyways, um, probably more exciting to me though was um, sort of thinking about the, and let me pull it up right here. Um, the other health um, benefits specif specifically. Um, hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Oh, there it is. Specifically dealing with um, chemotherapy. So these behind me are um, from a documentary. Um, I pulled it, um, it's not my work. DNA uh, strands from the heart, liver, and uh, muscle tissues. Um, so you can see um, the three of those. And the one uh, at the top, that is uh, expression from no days of fasting of the heart, liver, and muscle cells. And um, the second one is day, is an expression from day two um, uh, from two days of fasting. Um, and what the scientists are trying to show is that these cells, what it's conveying to them is it's, it's changing into a protected straight, uh, state. And, um, and you can see at the, uh, very bottom, it's an expression from two days of fasting from a healthy cell versus a cancerous cell. So you can see how, how different these cells have reacted depending on the state of their uh, nutritional intake, um, i.e. fasting. So essentially cancer cells apparently hate the, the low glucose, low IGF-1 growth factor environment of a fasted state, which may potentiate the, the uh, chemotherapy uh, effects and mitigate its side effects. 
So it sounds sort of counterintuitive, right? To tell a patient undergoing chemotherapy not to get nutritious meals before treatment, but many studies are showing otherwise. Um, it's interesting because fasting may help, may, keyword may, help chemotherapy patients mitigate side effects associated with treatment, um, sort of by encouraging vital cells into this protected state and conversely cancerous cells pushing them into an unprotected state so um you know uh, that being said it's not you know fasting is something you should take seriously that's why i gave the disclaimer in the beginning you know there are potential problems i mean people with a bmi of 18 and a half or under that doesn't really make sense because you don't have a lot of stored fat right um, people who are already on insulin medication, you know, in a fasted state, you're changing your insulin resistance. And if you're on insulin medication, you got to be aware of that. That could be a problem. Um, potential electrolyte deficiencies in extended fasts of longer than 14 days. Um, that's why usually people supplement with like multivitamins, Himalayan pink salt, um, put potentially like uh, additional magne uh, magnesium and, and, and potassium. Um, I can tell you when I was on my 30 day fast by like the second or third week, I did start to feel faint and I fainted a couple of times and uh, reintroducing salt, just taking maybe like, uh, you know, just a little pinch of salt throughout the day, rectified it. I was no longer fainting. Um, Ooh, another thing that uh, you got to be aware of is refeeding too quickly from uh, these long extended fasts that can definitely lead to some uh, issues. But speaking of refeeding, people seem to recommend refeeding slowly with um, like vegetables and fruit like watermelon. And that sounds counterintuitive to me. If you're fasting, you've already exhausted your um, glycogen supplies your body is using fat for food. Why would you want to confuse it by introducing like watermelon, which I've heard a lot of, which has, you know, sugar. It's, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So how I broke in my fast is I start off with uh, drinking broth. The longer it is, the longer I do this broth process, this intermediate a reintroducing of food, this refeeding of food. Then I go to eggs, hard boiled, you know, and then I'll introduce more fats. So refeeding slowly is definitely recommended. And my um, inclination, I gravitate towards refeeding with fats um, and maybe some greens, but whatever. Uh, and then the biggest other problem is compliance, right? It ain't going to work if you don't do it. So uh, a lot of people struggle with the mental aspect of what I'm not eating, but I'm telling you, I mean, by the, the first time I ever did it, by the third day, I was not hungry and I was amazed. By the second day, I was not hungry and, uh, and, and I was amazed. So let's put this background away. Um, most prescribed extended fasts, I believe, are like no longer than 14 days. If you know, there are some facilities that assist you and monitor you um, and actually prescribe these longer fasts like Dr. Jason Fung. Um, and uh, usually not done unless in anything but like uh, extreme cases. Uh, longer than that, I would classify as extreme fasting, like the 30 days or 40 days. Um, the point is the average human body has enough stored fat reserves, energy reserves to last you 40 days. So if you're, you know, thinking about like a two, three days or intermittent fasting, don't, I mean, once again, do your own research, but that's not something to worry about. As far as supplements, uh, I couldn't find any real definitive answers. Most professionals and fasting clinics have shown no impactful drops in nutrition levels, uh, nutrient levels as the body self-regulates, excuse me. They don't usually prescribe any supplements, but for these, you know, longer fasts uh, past 14 days, some people argue that um, you might want to supplement or your choice of water determines the need to supplement. Um, you know, I think the recommendation is you want to drink distilled water to avoid contaminants and toxins and fluoride. Um, but then you do lose like the magnesium and the potassium and the chloride. So thus the suggestion to add these 
um, if you are going to do some sort of like extended um, extended fast. So um, I guess final word is there's still a lot of information uh, yet to be studied. Um, still might be a controversial topic, more research to be made, questions to, to ask. But uh, at this point from people a thousand times smarter than me, uh, it all seems like the conclusion is fasting seems like a promising and relatively safe um, way to promote your health. And don't forget, fasting is free. What more can you ask, right? So uh, anyways, I hope you got some information, maybe got the ball rolling. I'll put some links in the description below, blah, blah, blah. Erase that image of me when I was like a thousand pounds from your brain. And I wave bye. Bye-bye.